Hey boys and girls, um, welcome back to Monroe uh, Live. Um, today what we're going to do is we're going to look a little bit at the styling and the uh, creature comforts that are associated with uh, today's electric vehicles. So uh, I've got Josiah and I've got Carl with me, but first I'd like to thank the folks here at, um, at uh, GR Auto Gallery. Now I've never been here before, this is in Commerce, uh, Commerce Township. But uh, I'm telling you what, this warehouse is full, I mean chock-a-block, with absolutely fabulous cars, and you can buy any of them. You want an E-Type? There's one right over there. You want to you have a uh, 32 Deuce? I think you got one right over here. This, this, place is, uh, this place is fantastic, so we'd like to thank those folks, and I think there's going to be a little blurb on where you can, how you can get in touch with them. So anyway, um, Josiah, why don't you give us a little background? Josiah's from uh, Sunberg Ferrar. That's right. So I'm Josiah Lacola, industrial designer at Sunberg Ferrar and vehicle design specialist there too. Uh, so Sunberg Ferrar is uh, an 88 year strong uh, industrial design firm right here in Wald Lake, uh, Metro Detroit. And we, uh, we're kind of like the skunk works of industrial design. Um, we uh, uh, consult for any company that um, needs, you know, additional industrial design assistance, uh, or if you don't know what you're supposed to do next uh, in uh, in your in your product lineup, uh, that's where we come in. We have full uh, industrial design research capabilities, uh, and of course, uh, engineering to uh, to accompany that. So. Uh, yeah, Sunberg Ferrar has a long history of, uh, you know, 60% of the uh, American uh, local um, uh, transit systems in the U.S. And um, everything from uh, full-size commercial trucks to um, a 50-year relationship with Whirlpool designing uh, appliances. So, a uh, huge uh, range of products and capabilities at Sunberg Ferrar, and we're happy to work with uh, Monroe and uh, to be here at the GR Auto Gallery. And I am Carl, a more recent employee with Monroe and Associates. My background has been in automotive interiors for the past 10 years. Um, so I've been working with and consulting with different vehicle models within their interiors within Monroe and then also in the past. Now, I had a quick question for you though. You said industrial design. Can you actually kind of define the parameters of design and the different types? That is a good point. And there is a lot of, uh, it, it's a little bit of a convoluted term once in a while. Uh, so yeah, the, the industrial design term specifically refers to really the human element um, of usability and also art in uh, product development. So it's, it's not just engineering. It's not uh, just filling out an equation. It's trying to get ahead of the curve and understanding uh, how this product, whatever it may be, is going to fit into someone's life and uh, how to create that so that they'll have some emotional connection to it. Um, I really, I think that's what sets it apart from strict engineering is the emotional and ergonomic element of that. Something I should mention is that um, <clears throat> Monroe and Sunberg Ferrar have been working together now for about uh, 20, 25 years. So, uh, we have a long history with, uh, with folks at Sunberg for our. So with that, let's uh, dive in. Let's uh, have a look at the Tesla first. I'll let, um, <clears throat> let Josiah uh, kick it off. Tell us what you think. We're gonna do the exteriors first. So. Yeah. So we wanted to start with the Model 3 primarily because it influenced all the other cars here in a way. Um, um, of course, the Model S, um, it's big sister was uh, really kicked things off for the, the mass production of, of uh, EVs. Um, what you see here is basically the most slick, most simple design you can essentially possibly come up with. Um, there are a lot of clever points on this car that um, uh, has been in uh, different uh, Monroe Live videos before. Um, I think the consistency of their visual brand language, their VBL, is kind of astonishing. They're super committed to uh, making all their cars look extremely related to each other, uh, save perhaps for the Cybertruck, but we don't have one of those here, so don't worry about it. So between a Model 3, a Model Y, even a Model S, 
even though one would be a larger platform, the overall look and styling of the lights, the rear end, is roughly the same, even if the architecture changes some. Exactly, right down to this little frowny brow right, right. here. Um, well, all those things, that frowny brow actually is um, <clears throat> something that uh, makes it a little more aerodynamic. Slippery is the term. This, this is the slipperiest uh, of all the EVs out there. They, uh, they sacrifice some styling um, for the, uh, the fact that they can, uh, they can make things slippery. And just, just so uh, we don't have a, <clears throat> a million people sending us little um, comments, the X is also very similar to, uh, to these vehicles as well. Um, and the only way that you can tell them apart is if, you, if you're just looking at glance, just quick glance and why not, door handles. <laughs> That's the fastest way for me to determine which one's which. If there's a, a white one in the parking lot, like this one here, you can tell that this is going to be a model, uh, <clears throat> it's gonna be a model three by the door handles. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a cool move on their part. I think as time goes by, they may add some features or something like that, but I doubt very much if it's gonna be much. That's yeah, for sure. I, I think I really appreciate how simple it is. Um, I think we'll talk in a moment about how some of these cars adopt kind of a false grill appearance. And this is something that has gotten away from that entirely. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the, the Model S started out with uh, a sort of mouth uh, that was blacked out um, as a sense of familiarity. Uh, they went away uh, from that with, uh, with the newer generation. And uh, from a purity standpoint, I think that's bold. And obviously you're saving some money with that too, uh, by not having a false element uh, on, on the front of the car. The other thing I like about Tesla is um, <clears throat> when we first got the, when we got the first Model 3, I made comments on, I don't know why we use Chrome. I, uh, I don't care for this stuff. Um, it's a heavy metal. Um, making uh, making chrome parts is, you know, kind of toxic. So anyway, they went from uh, chrome to uh, to black uh, black paint and things like that. They, they take suggestions at uh, Tesla. Uh, and I, I, I like that. Uh, I like that feature when people come along and they'll try it out, see what, you know, what's different or what's new or what people think. And then they make almost instant changes. I would almost venture to say that that's one of the most trendy design decisions on this is just going to a matte, uh, yeah. a matte black trim. Yeah, the one last uh, point about the visual brand language, the VBO and, and the design of the car in general, just catching up on some of your prior videos about the underbody, the, really the structural changes to the three that it's gone through basically three generations of structural redesign and the exterior has essentially been the same throughout. So uh, that's, that's kind of a, a cool commitment to Well, it's the opposite. Look. It's the opposite of a normal OEM. Normally, right. an OEM will change the top hat. They'll give you a new color or they'll uh, put some, some sticker or something on it. And then underneath, that's good for about 150 years. They don't change. But, uh, but these guys are a little different. They keep the outside styling. But anyway, I, I like the idea of keeping the same styling and then changing the things that are kind of really the most important. So. so the most important, yes, for the technology, for the vehicle, for the performance. The only thing that's stuck in my head, I'm remembering the Model T, the fight to go and introduce the Model A. They were kind of stuck with having the same thing, yeah. repeatability, but then competing against GM that had a bunch of different models for a bunch right. of different customers. So how long will the same look appeal to the same customer? If a customer owns their vehicle for four, five years, are they gonna buy the exact same vehicle? Knowing that some technology has changed, but they're getting the same look. That's the only thing that's a fear in my mind, but it's just a fear. I don't know how truthful it is. Yeah, I think the Cybertruck is gonna be a nice litmus test for yeah. how extreme you can go with a, a new design direction and uh, have that be acceptable or pull in some additional uh, customers. Yeah, well, why don't we move on to the Hyundai because uh, this, um, <clears throat> when uh, this uh, showed up in our parking lot, um, 
Sue, my wife and I, drove by it and um, we instantly recognized uh, that this was a different vehicle. I, I from, a, from a styling standpoint, man, this thing is like, uh, like um, one of those, uh, one of those you expect a car to transform, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. This is really a kind of a different, definitely different than everybody else from a styling standpoint. 100%. Um, I, I think this one is the most trendy of the pack that we have here. Um, and it really stands out from that. I think it's, uh, it's pulling in a lot of uh, the coolest concept, almost 80s uh, cues. Um, some of the cladding like lines on the bottom here. Uh, I think as we go around, I do want to talk about the, the role of cladding and body color changes on EVs. Um, essentially, the, the element of uh, the taller package and what that does to the design. Um, so what, what you're seeing on this car in particular is uh, bringing in that matte silver on the front, on the sides, everywhere. Um, you're just breaking up that visual mass. Uh, so that the body color appears more slender. And anytime you have a more slender appearance, you're going to have more sporty, agile associations with that design. Um, so this one is maybe not the perfect example since the body is gray and the trim is silver. So there's still some contrast there, but if this was white or black, you would really see that uh, difference between the silver and the and What and the I really gray. like is those wheels. Holy mackerel. Yeah. They yeah. really went uh, overboard with those. So the breakup you're talking about, we have the gloss gray paint, the matte silver front fascia. And the black line. The, uh, what I call a fender flare, what would it actually be? Uh, flare. The, the sawtooth flare also in the matte finish. The lower running board area also in matte finish. So that's a separation that you're talking about between the gloss paint and these stylized trim pieces. Exactly. And it, particularly from a distance, that really helps to break up the visual mass. And of course, this really strong DLO, the daylight opening, uh, the window shape. Uh, again, really nice, you know, gloss black uh, trim on that. You don't have the textured black that you typically have on so many cars. Um, so it Again, from a distance, you end up with one solid, really strong graphic right there. Um, uh, one cool thing about these wheels is that even though they look super intricate and you have this diamond finish and then the black paint, um, it's actually very flat and dish-like, so they're creating depth with color and finish. So you have uh, basically no depth at all, but it's still really visually interesting and from an arrow standpoint, it's like a pizza pan, right? Uh, so that air is just slipping right past that and not getting sucked into this deep dish wheel. Um, if we come around to the back, um, they, they did a great job with bringing in this digital element. The, the message of this car is digital, 100%. Like the, the, the shape of it is almost low poly, I wanna call it, uh, very you know angular boxy, but they're owning it. Um, I think there's a nice blend of smoothness and sharpness with well, this car. One Whereas, of the things I like, when they put the Ionic sign on here, <laughs> it floats. It, it, um, it actually seems like it's floating above the car. It gives you an optical illusion of, um, of it being um, something that really it isn't. I think that was really clever. I've never seen anybody else do that before. In fact, the bars on the back, a lot of people don't want to do that because, well, for a variety of reasons, but mostly it's cost. But uh, they, just, uh, they just threw caution to the wind and said, hey, we're doing it, and there it is. And I really like, I mean, normally I, I would shave that, a shaving meaning that I wouldn't put it on, but, uh, but they did a clever, that was a clever idea. Yeah. Great. Well, let's move on to um, our next competitor here. This is the um, Mustang. Um, Mach-E. Mach yeah. So this is the version we didn't get. This is the sportier version. Um, it still looks pretty much the same. And again, look at uh, how few elements 
they've got that are chromed. It's, it's kind of like the trend. I don't know, we started talking with our friends at Tesla and now you've got the, uh, the rest of the pack basically moving on in that direction. In fact, I just looked at it again. Ionic doesn't have very much at all. In nope, they, they moved totally on to matte silver and gloss black. Yeah. Um, so the big thing with this is that it, it really wants to be sporty. Uh, you've got this fastback design cue, which is a, a nice uh, um, way to actually hide the height of the car. You can see the, the roof is like four inches taller than, than the visual uh, fastback roof line. Uh, so you actually have a much more, you know, voluminous interior that way, but still have that almost X6 roof line um, uh, with uh, something that's actually much more compact with that. I, I was, when I first saw this car, I was surprised at how small it is. And actually on, on this whole row of vehicles, they're considerably smaller than, well, obviously the F-150 or the uh, IX. Uh, we also have the 65 Mustang back here just for uh, quick reference. And you can see some of the little design elements like these little three scallops on the front, which they brought into the headlamp design of the, uh, the Mach-E. Obviously it's, uh, you know, matching the three bar taillight design from, uh, I mean, the entire history of, of Mustang. I think they're, it's cool that they're embracing that for this and it doesn't, it doesn't really say Mustang anywhere on it. it it's just Mach-E GT. So it is its own thing in a way. Um, they got a lot of sculpting, especially in the side of this car. Uh, they really wanted to make it look slim. So really nice undercut right here. Um, and just very muscular uh, 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 body line here below the, the DLO. Um, haunches, just like you would expect on, on a Mustang. Um, and uh, below that, more of that gloss black trim to really show off, well, not show off, but hide <laughs> the, uh, the visual, uh, the, the, the physical height and reduce that into a much more sporty, agile uh, sports car like uh, uh, proportion with the body color section. So ideally, this would just disappear. When you're seeing it uh, drive down the road, it just, you don't even think about it. You focus on the, the yellow part and it looks great. So we've, uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, this was the car that basically changed my mind on whether anybody in North America would be able to compete. Um, uh, this came in just after um, I had had a look at the, uh, the Volkswagen um, ID4, and I really wasn't happy with the ID4. This came in, and I, I, before I did anything, I said, "Oh boy, a four-door Mustang. Why am I looking at this?" And um, and then at the end, uh, this one here right now, anyway, um, has my uh, seal of approval for second place. When we did the BMW. Um, the blue and tan one for the interior review. That was one thing that I was complaining about the rear seat. Me sitting in the rear seat, my head hit the headliner way before it hit the headrest. So something like this, it still has that sport look. And I like how you'd mentioned that because of the style separating out with the black, you can get the more headroom, but yet still have that sleek look. I, I like that, appreciate that as a taller person. Yeah, I think, uh, I doubt very much if Ford's changed too much in the way of um, how they want to design a car, but um, it used to be, if you weren't six, if, if a six foot four kind of person couldn't get in it, then it wasn't going to be a Mustang. It had to, you had to have, uh, you had enough room for a big guy to get in. And that's, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the effort that has to go in to industrial design because it has to be functional as well as beautiful. So. By the way, the other thing we didn't mention was initially Tesla's uh, gaps and whatnot were just absolutely horrific, destroyed the whole car. But now you look that Tesla, this Ionic, this Mustang, in fact, all the cars in here, including the BMW, all of them um, are really, really nice, nice fits. They, they've done a fabulous job. Even with these fancy contours, 
this is tough to do when you've got um, all these scallops and whatnot. It's it's very very difficult to uh, to make sure that when the uh, deck lid closes or the doors close, that the gaps are still in the right place. Yeah, stamping a compound curve that are then hinging and flexing past each other, especially the door joint right there, that would be a real big challenge to figure out what yeah. is your necessary gap for the function of that curve. Well, um, at Ford, when it came to styling, um, they say, just do it. And that was the end of it. You, uh, you were the mechanical engineer, you just yeah. did it. I did want to call out this um, hash, sorry, hex pattern um, on the beehive. grill. A, yeah, beehive, yeah. Um, you'll see the modern interpretation of that on the front of the Mach-E. Um, beyond that, I, I guess, yes, the, the, the original line, this top fender line uh, coming into this nice little haunch, that everything was so subtle in this era it, in some ways. Uh, you know, you have this almost uh, humble um, simplicity to it. Um, but anyway, you still have this little haunch showing uh, that it's got some power and, 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 that, yeah. and that this waist and with, with uh, you know, insinuating some agility. Uh, and you, you still have that on the Mach-E. So <laughs> this is, um, I was um, <clears throat> not able to afford something like this when I was a kid, but this was a car that people in my era would aspire to and it was inexpensive. To get a red hot car, if you wanted a red hot car, you were probably looking at something English. You'd be going at, uh, looking at an Austin Healey or a Jaguar, or maybe one of the German vehicles. But uh, when this came out, this was really and truly the first American muscle car, and everybody wanted one, and it was at a tremendously good price. It was like a third of the price of uh, even thinking about a Jaguar. So this came out, this was a big, big deal. Um, like I say, I couldn't afford one. <laughs> and of course, being a 65, this is still very early. Yeah. Since yeah. Mustang was a latecomer, calling it the 1964 and a half. Yeah. And going into that, into this. So it's not like they had a lot of time to change things and refine. They pretty much started out with this type of uh, look and execution and style. Right, and, and you can see that some of the styling cues tried to get you away from the Jaguar, looking like it's got knockoffs for the hubcaps and whatnot. These kinds of things, uh, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of it, this is Lee Iacocca's uh, star pony. He, this is what uh, made him uh, uh, the guy he was at Ford and then later on Chrysler. Um, this was, he hung his hat on this um, he bet his job on it, and uh, the Henry, <laughs> the Deuce uh, is what they used to call him, Henry II. Um, he uh, he really didn't see what was going to go on with this. He was kind of like in a big car mode, you know, making it look like a brick, and um, with another brick glued to the top, and have lots of room, a bench seat. He didn't like these at all. So at the end of the day. Um, Lee took a big, uh, big gamble and, uh, and it paid off for him and for Ford Motor Company. So the Lightning, oh. along with the Mach-E, shares, I guess we can just zoom right into the grill first, uh, shares right. that hexagonal modernized beehive element. Um, so it's nice to have a little commonality between two very different EVs. Uh, so the Lightning, a storied name, of course, uh, from their performance versions of, of the F-150 uh, fits perfectly into an electrified name, right? Lightning. Um, I think this is a, a really major move uh, for, for Ford, uh, but it's not a major move uh, in the design world, to, to be honest. And well, when we it, get inside, then, then, sure. then, then we'll see a difference. But Outside, I think they kept the outside shape, and I think it was a smart move on their part uh, because um, because basically it it uh, it uh, allows people to move from ice to EV you know, without a without too much of a uh, uh, not no hiccup, no nothing. Here it is. Yeah, you're exactly uh, right. It, it's but, the total opposite of the Cybertruck, for instance. Exactly. And you need yeah. that range in the market. Yeah. That's what this is fulfilling. 
So I have a question for you. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been asked, because this is our truck. This is our truck from uh, Monroe. And, uh, and we've been using it. If you look in the bed, you can see it's been used. Yeah. There's no question about it. And everybody that's drove it likes it. But there's been a comment, a consistent comment. How come this doesn't have like a big lightning bolt on the door or something that says lightning in big bold letters so that people know what it is? So what's the styling, uh, what's the styling guy have to say about that? Well, I think what your point was earlier about it sort of blending in and being a normal mature truck is is what is playing into that and what is causing that. I mean, it does have this cool logo on the back, lightning with the blue uh, surround yeah. behind it. So it's carrying its name for sure. But overall, you're right. You just want it to be a truck. It happens to be electric. And there are a few elements like these translucent light bars front and back. Yeah. This is a totally unique element for, um, for the lightning apart from the F-150 uh, ICE, uh, and of course the you know the lighting, the grill, the I guess you could call it a fascia, but other than that, it's just supposed to look like a truck, so uh, I and it carries that out. Three car buyers, we have the car buyer who wants an electric vehicle and is completely willing to go to something like a Rivian, which is very different, or something like a Cybertruck, which will be very different. We have the people that do want to go to electric, but they want some consistency they want to feel comfortable but then we have that buyer who says electric is stupid i need the power of my truck if you have this parked in between them this can pull up next to the regular truck and the guy getting out of his regular truck may not even notice so yes they have sold one to the customer that did want electric but it kind of nudges the person next to him to convince them that actually you're getting the same thing well, I'll tell you what, if I was in the sticker business, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would come up with some kind of a lightning sticker and, um, and glue it to, uh, and sell it so other people could glue it to their side doors or maybe the, maybe the hood used to do that kind of stuff with, um, yeah. with uh, hoods in the, far <laughs> in, the, in the olden days. Um, uh, simply because I'd want everybody to know that uh, I'm on the... Uh, I'm on the path to, uh, to a cleaner world. That would, that would be my ticket anyway. But and that would be related to the Raptor for sure with the yeah. giant decal on the back. Exactly. You know, the, the mud splatter decal. Yeah. Uh, we should look at this, uh, this logo, by the way. It, you know, this is the coolest way to not actually illuminate a logo and uh, have it sort of appear uh, backlit. But this does have a lot of features in it that I don't know whether we uh, we need to call them as far as styling and whatnot is concerned. But <laughs> telling you what, having all of those outlets in the back and 220 plus I can power my house. Uh, I think Ford did a remarkably smart bunch of moves when they when they put this car out. I I don't know. To me. The, the, the tailgate with the extra step and everything, all these things just all of a sudden kind of appeared uh, on the Lightning. So I'm kind, of a, I'm kind of a fan. That's why we bought one. That's why I wanted it in. So now we have, we have the Tesla, the Rivian, and uh, the Lightning. All of them are at Monroe, and it kind of, mm, I don't know, sets the stage for, for what, what I want the image of the company to be. Progressive, electric, whatever, EV. I think uh, I think the the Lightning is a, and they were the first. I mean, really and truly, being first sometimes um, out of the trenches if you're being shot at by an enemy, um, that's kind of uh, heroic to try and do something like that. Same thing is true here with taking the um, the uh, the breadwinner, if you like, at uh, at Ford. Um, electrifying it and getting it in the market before everybody else, including Tesla. Hmm. That, uh, that has big cojones associated with it. Yeah. When I worked in research, that was one thing we always joked about was everyone wanted to be first to be second. Exactly. Let the other guy take all of the uh, cost of the development, the trial and error, the criticism yeah. in the market, and then do the things that actually worked. Yeah. At Ford, actually, it used to be the the, the, the system or whatever that they used to talk about all the time was 
second but better dressed. Uh, but now Ford's taken the, well, they took the lead on that one, they took the lead on this one. Oh, thank you for lighting it up for us. Well, actually, um, one of the nice things about the Rivian is um, it's actuated by my cell phone. So uh, this is my vehicle, my wife and I's vehicle. Um, we, uh, we bought this um, because when the, uh, when the vehicle came in for teardown, my wife said, I don't think so. And so we bought another and it costs an extra, an extra 50 grand uh, to get that other vehicle. But this thing here has just been absolutely brilliant. And we're extremely happy with it. So I'm going to, I don't want to gush all over it. So I'll let you guys talk and, uh, and I will keep my okay. lip buttoned unless well, you miss something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of hard not to gush about this thing because it is, um, it, for an introductory product for a company, right? The first one out of their gate. Uh, I think they pulled off a premium product really well. Um, I, I think uh, the design itself has a great blend of uh, reservation, but also athleticism. And I know I keep bringing that up, but it is the trend right now. Maybe, you know, in the 70s, it was luxury. Now it's athleticism and sport. Um, so while overall your body side is really simple, clean, uh, there are some elements uh, to make it a little bit more familiar uh, as a truck because uh, the construction is much more SUV or car-like being a unibody. Um, but what they did to make up for that in a way is add this design element along the, the, the side of the door and forward to sort of separate the cab from the utility area. Um, so that's a, that's a nice little design line. And uh, again, just makes it feel more like a pickup. Uh, lots of awesome usability in this. I, I think from an automotive design perspective, this is the most product-like uh, of anything here, and uh, they bring in uh, the most industrial design into, uh, into their product uh, of, of anyone here. I mean, uh, when we go through the interior, we'll, we'll talk about all the little you know, pop out flashlights and speakers and all this stuff um, right down to the, the gear tunnel. So you can um, open that now. Just push oh yeah. that button. Yeah. Yeah. So that opens up. I don't know if you're going to get the camp stove, uh, but there's just, yeah, just little elements. I mean, look at the, yeah, the choosing this type of material and the, the little yellow stripe here. I mean, it's, it's very stylish. Um, of course, you're paying for that all. Uh, Actually, <laughs> this car at $72,000, there's no way in the world they can make a penny on it. Um, and so when I first got it, um, I, I sent him a note and said, this car is at least $100,000. Uh, don't, uh, don't sell yourself short. I mean, the features and functions. And, it, you know, some of the things that I don't understand, why is it that no one else thought of putting a little door there I mean, I could do something on the F-150 and whatnot and have some, you have some room there. Why, why didn't we, why didn't we see that before? Yeah. I just, well, since we're here with classic cars, the club cars in the 20s and 30s did have that access. Yeah, door. right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's that. And, and it's been an aftermarket feature that it had really never, never really caught on. Uh, but on this, it's a little more compact, so it wouldn't necessarily work, but like on a longer bed truck, you do have options of like modifying the side for uh, yeah, additional then you storage. Lose part of your exactly. Your, yeah, there's your, always a compromise. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I'll tell you something else that I absolutely I, I I can't stop sometimes, but um, but this um, this is such a great idea, and we've recommended. Oh, forgot. Sue's got crap in here. We've recommended this to uh, company after company after company. Pretty much every OEM that, that we've worked with, um, we said, you know, why don't you put a timbre door in? We use them on airplanes all the time. I mean, they're, it's like uh, one of these universal things. Everybody has to have at least 
a couple of timbre doors when you get into first class and whatnot. Uh, but, but for some reason or other, nobody did it. I just love the fact that this thing is on here. It's easy to open up and close up. I don't have to store something. I don't have a rag that uh, basically blows off in the wind. I, I, like, uh, I like this. Yeah. And then, like the Lightning, it's got um, it's got electrical outlets, and one extra thing here is uh, this one. Uh, this one has an air compressor yep. because it's got air ride. They just you know. Yeah, it's got it already. Yeah, it's so, in there, so might as well utilize yeah, it too. That, that's tied into their active lifestyle. With yeah. you know, you want to air down your tires, and you can air them back up too, since it yeah. has air ride. Yeah, it's also got the light bar in the back. Uh, I do want to call attention to a couple things on the side um, on the top. We have uh, a, a nice little evolution from flat roof, and the way that falls off is uh, it's really subtle, but it's a visual cue to how they want the, the air to peel off of the roof. Um, obviously, efficiency is incredibly important with, uh, I, I mean, it should be for every vehicle, but with EVs, you want all, all the range you can possibly get. So um, if you were to continue that arc, through its path, yeah. it takes you right to the back of the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then on the bottom, you have more of this uh, black trim. So as I called out on the Ionic and on the Mach-E, um, you've got this division of, of body color and trim. You know, this is considerable. That's like 10 inches uh, once you get to the, the very bottom of the car. And that just slims out the body side. Again, you've got this cool green color that's what you're really focusing on. It's all about uh, visual tricks in a way. But again, helps the proportion to, to no end. Lots of little arrow cues on this. I'm sure everyone's noticed by now. Um, uh, it, it doesn't make it any easier to produce with all these flow throughs, but uh, it's, it's just really nice detailing um, uh, the way these different masses are kind of intersecting uh, and coming through. The, I think the styling on this is, uh, it, it conveys strength, uh, you know, with with being so uh, geometric, uh, but also um, just rounded enough to be not fragile. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to get through with strength. Mm -hmm. So, so um, personally, I think when I first saw this thing, I said, this thing looks like a frog. And, uh, and my wife likes frogs. And I think that that's one of the reasons that she went for the car. But the eyes, the smiling mouth, whatever. It does, uh, yes, it's, um, it's a little polarizing, I guess. And, and there is a, a dichotomy occurring uh, because of the seriousness of the horizontal light element. Um, a little bit like the RoboCop relation of, yeah. of the Ionic, right? Yeah. It's, it's like a furrowed brow, yeah. right? It's a serious face. And then you have this very friendly appearance of, of the vertical pill lights uh, in the middle. And uh, yeah, a dichotomy is the only way yeah. I can put that. So you kind of you kind of pick your own face. What do you want to see in this? And that's what you uh, attach yourself to. Well, when we were working with Toyota, they said that there's happy cars, um, mediocre or ordinary, or I can't remember what that term was. And then angry cars yeah. so um most uh, most most cars that want to uh appear like they're uh, they're going to take on the planet yeah. like the mustang are angry cars see the headlights are dialing up and stuff like that so it's kind of uh kind of this this kind of falls into the happy car uh mode i think uh, whenever i used to work with designers and we had an issue with studio designers and it was a design that I felt had to be changed. The only way I could actually get them to change it is by giving some sort of a descriptive word that stuck into people's heads. So when other people within their company would use that same term or that same word, it would make the designer so mad that they would purposely change it. So it's like, if, if I were to call this a frog and it stuck into the designer's head, he says, I don't want a car that looks like a frog, but then everyone else starts seeing a frog, he might change it. If I looked at the Ionic, Ionic, Ionic here, and I said, that's RoboCop's helmet. And if they're comfortable saying RoboCop's helmet, it would keep it. Yeah, if they gonna, weren't, who's going to change that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Um, 
no matter what it looks like or how you want to describe it, my wife loves this car. So anyway, let's move on to the next most polarizing of all the vehicles. <clears throat> this uh, BMW, um, when, uh, when it showed up, uh, my wife instantly disliked it. Corey's not, uh, not real thrilled with it either. I love the outside styling. I think it's absolutely brilliant, but um, I'm in the minority. What, did, what, would, what were your thoughts? I like the outside styling. I hate the fact that the grill looks like a sticker. So we have three vehicles here that have a grill. This BMW, the Lightning, and then the Mach-E. The rest are all kind of washed out. So they're trying to keep this image of having a grill to make people comfortable with the vehicles and the styles they've had in the past. But in doing it, they made it look like a sticker. If they could have had more texture, which I know they're gonna sacrifice arrow, but I think they're sacrificing arrow with this big front blade to begin with, Hmm. I just don't like that the grill is a sticker, in my mind. Well, to me, um, you have to have styling cues in order to keep a car. And this one, um, this one has plenty of them. So you've got that. you got the steering wheel, which is kind of the same, uh, uh, the same um, <clears throat> uh, hexagon or beehive. And then they've gone to the, uh, to the extent of putting putting that same hexagon right into the carbon fiber weave. Uh, that's kind of, uh, that's, I think that's kind of cool. When we get to the interior, there's even more of them. Yeah, but, let's, uh, let's pop back to the front for a second because yeah. even though you said you're in the minority, in this case, out of three, I guess you're in the majority because I can't stand this thing. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, when you want to talk about angry cars, this is uh, definitely in the category of angry cars. What, one redeeming quality about this is that, okay, the rest of the car is big enough that you can get a headlamp that looks very squatty and very thin proportionally that actually contains all your necessary lighting elements. Uh, a long time trend has been to have a, a dual lamp set up where you have this kind of fake DL, uh, uh, daylight running light um, and then just stuffing a projector somewhere beneath that. Um, so this is nice that it's all you know, housed in one, one, one piece. Uh, I will say the, the surfacing on this car is great. It's BMW, really nice detailing, all these, you know, the quality of the lines and the tension of the surfaces. Uh, where it gets lost to me is proportion, gesture, cohesiveness. That's where it all falls off the board, unfortunately, with this car. Um, not, to, not to go back to any of the other ones, but I think there's a level of consistency and um, unified uh, um, direction that is just lacking here. Uh, particularly, the differences between some of the volume of the surfaces, like uh, even, even this here, and then uh, the, the, the voluptuousness of this side, uh, side transition, and then the comparison to the wheel arches. So with the wheel arches, you have this kind of awkward mass um, that while simple, you know, it is one fender. You're not trying to hide anything with an additional trim piece or anything, but the, the shape from totally round, true wheel arch to flattened out um, uh, body line is disconcerting. Especially when you compare it to the Rivian here, where they just went with a squared off wheel arch. Like it's, they made up their mind and that's nice. Uh, it's a little more relaxing to look at. Um, some of the other elements on the, on the front here. Um, so instead of having a, a, a false trim piece on the fender to reduce some of that mass, they brought that into the side panel on, on either side of the fascia. Um, and again, this is a lower contrast um, um, uh, paint scheme. So you have the dark red and then the black. It's kind of the same problem as the mid gray with silver. It's lower contrast. But if this was a, a white paint job with, with the black trim, you would really see kind of the mismatch between how low this blade goes and then how much lower the center grill 
goes. So you have this, the black essentially just disappears. Um, and uh, when, when you see those, those masses, there's just that this mismatch, you know, this doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, this indentation. Even this, uh, this transition is not matched up with this line here. I guess they, they do converge yeah, way style, out here. Yeah, but the style there's, line below. Yeah, there's, uh, there's just a lot of... <clears throat> well, one of the things that I thought was clever, and it had to be styled in for sure, this, this hood does not open, okay? No uh, there's no frunk here. This is um, all of the electronics and whatnot, but the, how do I get the windshield wiper fluid? Oh yeah, let's do it right here. I thought that was very clever. And the reason I liked it was because in 1992, because I went and looked it up, we actually got a design job from, uh, from Chrysler. It was a design and engineering job. And uh, we wanted this because we were working on a minivan and women don't like opening hoods to, uh, to fill up the washer fluid. So we took that idea and we put it into the cowl. You didn't even notice it. You just push on it, it would pop up. You could fill it from outside, close it up and you're done. It was rejected. We tried it again when we were working with Ford. We tried it again when we were working with General Motors and it was always rejected. Oh no, no one will want to buy that. When I saw this, I started laughing. I, I thought, well, I guess the they BMW thought, around. yeah. Now that you don't need to check your oil every week. <clears throat> yeah, there's, no, uh, it, there's, no, there's no need to open the hood and check yeah, all that. Right. So let's, let's have a look at the, uh, the uh, back end of this thing. Yeah. I actually don't mind the rear. Um, so it, it's um, a little more expected, I suppose you could say. I'm not sure if this is open, but I know we did want to talk a little bit about regulatory um, uh, requirements. Re yeah, re uh, regulatory requirements and their effect on design. Um, and uh, if this is, it's not. Oh well, we're gonna have to come back to that maybe with the interior. Uh, but point being on the, uh, with the taillights, what you're seeing here is the entire taillight is on the hatch. Um, so what's inside the hatch is an entire another set of taillights in the event that you uh, are driving with the tailgate open. Okay, there we go. A cool little waking sign here. See if it, there we go. Thank you, Sandy. So now you have these little mini taillights, and they do kind of look like taillights from a mini. Uh, but you have all your legal functions twice, um, which is uh, kind of annoying. But that's kind of run of the mill with uh, the Q7, Q5 have that. Um, again, just to, uh, what, what you are getting is uh, opening up the, the hatch. So you have a completely open space. You don't have this weird transition. Uh, you, just, you just need that extra set of lights. I, I like the styling. Uh, this does drive like a laser beam. I mean, you point it, and it's going to go there. There's no, um, there's no uh, disputing that. And the fact that, again, we're going to do the interior in a bit, but this, <laughs> this thing has all-wheel steering. So of all of the vehicles that I've ever had, this has probably got the tightest turning radius I've ever experienced. It's fabulous. I can turn around in my driveway. This thing is brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, some of the other, especially the trucks, have the turning radius of the Queen Mary, but uh, but it. You should get a, dri this, a gravel driveway then. This thing would. Oh spin yeah, right well, with a gravel driveway, no problem. But uh, yeah. I just put in concrete, so uh, we're not we're not going to do that. No one. What about the lower reflectors? I was looking at how much they protrude, and it was bugging me. Yeah, I I get what you're saying. Um, this this is another element of me scratching my head. Why? Uh, because. What this is related to is uh, an undercar diffuser, and it does have a pretty slick bottom, and it has these little fins here to insinuate that it is managing the air. Who knows how functional those are? Yeah, this is a more 
traditionally sized car for sure. It's much more practical in size than the i3. I think the i3 is a great European sized car. I really like the design of the i3 personally. No kidding. Um, no. I guess we don't it's... agree on anything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, five out of six isn't bad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things that this does carry through is um, this floating uh, C-pillar block. So instead of the traditional BMW Hofmeister kink that is normally, you know, quintessential BMW, um, you're putting in this blanking panel, which is present on the i3, present on the i8. Uh, so here it is on the iX. Um, so it, it's bringing a little touch of futurism with the semi-floating roof, um, which is cool. Well, we've gone through the, uh, the six vehicles here, and um, we're going to probably do this in two passes. One's going to be the exterior, and then we're going to go in and do the interior of each one of these six. So before I uh, close it up, um, Carl, you got any comments? What are your uh, what are your thoughts on the six cars? If I were to pick one for style, for the exterior to purchase for myself, I would pick the BMW. Now, ah, two of us, good, good job. <laughs> well, here's my mindset about that. I really like the way that it looks. It is very aggressive in its look. Now the question is someone would say is, oh, but that's not aerodynamic. You're going to lose range. All right, the car that I currently drive is 25% worse fuel economy than the car I drove previously. I picked it because it was comfortable. I decided I'm sacrificing range. I'm sacrificing fuel economy for comfort. So I would sacrifice that for the style. If this is not going to be as efficient as something else, I don't care. That's what I would want to pick for style. Now it'll be something different when we go into the interiors, however. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I guess we know where he stands. How about you then? Well, if I was to choose, I would have to go with the Rivian. Um, I think it's, uh, it's just awesome to drive and uh, kind of fits into an ideal lifestyle, I want to say. Um, however, I guess as a general statement uh, for this whole collection of cars, I think what we're finally seeing is uh, getting past early adopters. And um, so up to this point, there's been a certain association with kind of weirdness, like the i3, I guess, mm. with uh, wanting to really make a statement with an EV. And now we're into this era of normalcy in a way of, of this is a car with electric drive frame. It's, it's not something from outer space necessarily. Maybe it's from the future, but these are all uh, perfectly acceptable on the road right now. Um, and I, so I think it's a, a little bit of a sweet spot of acceptability for uh, EVs. And I think that's important when you're talking about who your customer is. Yeah, yes. For early adopters, they may have needed that. But Buick still sells hundreds of thousands of vehicles per year. Mm. It's like, what is the style going to be when those transition over to yeah. electric vehicles as well? There's still millions of buyers that haven't gone electric that are looking for something that is may not be represented here. Well, that was kind of how I was going to wrap it up um, because my wife absolutely loves this car, the Tesla, from a styling standpoint, from a driving standpoint, for getting around. There's nobody going to talk her out of that. For me, I like the Rivian. If I was going to talk to Andrew, our uh, the guy that actually drives this truck the most. He's going to tell me that that's the best thing since sliced bread. And so consequently, we're getting into, I like the style of this, or I like the functions and features of that, or I need the workability of this. I want to go fast. I want to look like uh, Knight Rider or whatever it was, or I want to stay with Tesla. You're, you're getting now a lot of variety that's out there, and, it can, and that's what's going to make the difference, I think, in the future. So with that happy note, uh, thanks for watching and stay tuned. We're going to be here to talk about the interiors um, on the next show. Thanks again for watching, uh, watching Monroe Live. Thanks to uh, all the folks uh, over, at, um, over at Sunberg Farrar. And uh, thank you to the, um, to the group here that allowed us to uh, um, take, our, take our videos and whatnot. Anyway, stay tuned. Thank you.